Hello and welcome to the third in a series of midweek materials for the week beginning 4th of May, following the sermons from our Sunday mornings in the Ely Teen Ministry. My name's Phil Marsh and my family and I started worshipping at St Mary's uh, back uh, early last summer. Last Sunday, Matt Phillips uh, shared with us his reflections on doing justice as we follow a series of sermons based on Micah 4 verse 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy and walk humbly with your God. In his sermon, Matt encouraged us to see how all people, regardless of background or lifestyle or geography or age or any variation that you can think of between us, how we are all made in God's image. We are all precious in God's sight. When we look into the eyes of any individual, we look into the eyes of the precious child of God, just as we are all the same. This, Matt shared with us, is where our thinking on seeking justice and acting justly might begin. Aware that we ourselves might unwittingly or consciously carry within our frames unconscious bias. Prejudices and ways of thinking by which we judge people. And as a result, we might not seek to actively oppress them, but it can lead us to disregard others and in particular their plight. We become more focused on our own needs and the needs of those who are like us or indeed whom we like and love. Matt suggests that to do justice, we need to actively seek out the vulnerable, the weakest and the least and try to help them. To look behind us, he said, at those we might not have noticed. Thus, he left us with a twin challenge to, first of all, learn to think of others justly. And then, secondly, to begin acting justly towards them. So in this midweek study, we're going to look a little bit more at God's passion for justice and then think a little as to how we might play our part in it. So appearing on the screen now are a series of Bible verses which I want to encourage you to spend some time looking at. If you're watching this material on your own, then perhaps pick two or three of them, read them and just reflect a little on what it tells us about God's passion and God's heart for justice. If you're doing this in a group, perhaps on a Zoom chat or similar, then uh, pick some of these verses each, maybe read them and then share with the rest of the group what you have found in those, in those verses. Either way, pause the video now and take 10 minutes or so to uh, explore some of this uh, rich picture of God's passion of justice and, um, and then resume the video again when you're ready. So I wonder what you found as you looked at some of those passages of scripture in relation to justice and in particular God's heart, God's passion for justice. As Paul mentioned last week, this is not simple advice for good living. This isn't some kind of moral code by which to live by. These commands of God to walk humbly, to love mercy, uh, to act justly, these lie right at the very heart of God's passion for the created order. Remember in the beginning when God made all things, he declares them good. In fact, he declares them very good. The way things are now is not as was intended and God's plans and purposes are to bring around a full restoration of the entire created order. God's passion for justice burns fiercely within him. It runs through all of his salvation work. So a couple of questions that might help us think about this further might be, in what ways does seeking justice or acting justly look differently to charity? And what do you hate about the way things are? What are the things that you would identify as unjust in this world? You see, because this isn't a study about injustice, it's a study about justice. So what does the world look like when those things that you hate are done away with? When those injustices that you can name come to an end, what does it look like? Have a go at naming some, but also at 
describing what the world would be like if those things weren't in place. Those two questions are on the screen and so take uh, a few minutes to pause the video and discuss these two questions together and then resume the video again when ready. Okay, so to act justly is to align ourselves with the purposes of God. What exactly did Jesus mean when he said, come follow me? For many of us, our primary engagement with the call to faith in Christ Jesus is a call to personal salvation. To know that we are loved, to know that we're forgiven, to know that we're made right with God, and ultimately to know that our eternal destination is known and secure. And praise God, for I need that more than most. All of it is true. But we might want to assess how much of our relationship to God depends on our own feelings of personal comfort and security and how much of our relationship with God drives our activity and our movement towards other people in love and in justice. How does it impact our care for others or even how does it impact our care for the world? Jesus' mission was not just to redeem us nor was it even just to redeem and rescue humanity. But actually in scripture, we see a picture that God's restorative and redemptive work in Christ Jesus was for the whole of the created order. In Romans chapter eight, Paul writes this. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. It isn't just about us. Uh, God's justice is for the whole of the created order, for its liberation from bondage and decay. The resurrection, overcoming death, is not just for human beings. Removing death from the created order is part of God's restorative work, part of God's justice for his creation. God's justice is seen in his passion for the needs of the poorest and the oppressed. The Messianic King is prophesied in uh, uh, the Old Testament to deliver the oppressed. The day shall come, sings Mary, when the proud are put down from their thrones and those of low degree are exalted. God shall oppose the proud and lift up the humble. A verse, a phrase that repeats itself throughout scripture. In God's new heaven and in God's new earth, justice is seen to dwell. Karl Barth sums it up this way, a theologian. The human righteousness required by God and established in obedience, the righteousness which according to Amos should pour down as a mighty stream, favours the threatened innocent, the oppressed poor, widows, orphans and aliens. For this reason... In the relations and events in the life of his people, God always takes his stand unconditionally and passionately on this side and on this side alone, against the lofty and on behalf of the lowly, against those who already enjoy right and privilege and on behalf of those who are denied and deprived of it. You might ask, so does that mean that God hates rich people? <laughs> By all means, no. But all of us, whether we are rich or poor, we are invited to make use of the whole of our lives and all that we are in pursuit of God's kingdom, in pursuit of God's justice. So what does following Jesus look like? Well, in part and in truth, a big part, it looks like aligning ourselves with God's passion for justice. And that means aligning ourselves with the poor and the least and the dispossessed and the disregarded. This then shapes how we spend time, how we spend our money, 
who we spend time with even and how we pray and what we pray for. It impacts what we allow ourselves and what we deny ourselves for the sake of others. I think when we think of it this way, we're beginning to get to that place of appreciating that justice is something we do rather than simply believe in. Acting justly is to play our part in being determined to see God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. As an aside, some will ask about punitive justice. In God, putting all things right, what about the wicked? What about wrongdoers? What about the justice that weighs in against them? Well, of course, punitive and redemptive justice come together in the cross of Christ. And here we find massive grace and mercy. Christ's death and resurrection, writes Paul in Romans, justifies the ungodly. Where we should receive punishment and right and proper judgment for our part in the injustices of this world, for our wrongdoing, for our disregard for the other, for our self selfishness, we find instead grace and mercy. We ourselves are the focus of God's restorative justice. And thus, we're then called to live our lives in response to that grace that we've received. Not only as we forgive, as we are forgiven, so we also seek justice, as we have received justice. We seek to regard the cause of the lowly and the least, as our cause has been regarded. Just as Christ gives himself for others, so we are called to give our lives for others. Just as Christ washes his disciples' feet on that Monday Thursday we not long ago celebrated, so Christ says to his disciples, you must now go and do likewise. For no, no servant is above his master, no student is above his teacher. As I have done for you, so you must now do for others. Our lives then, our living and our relationships, are to reflect God's passion for justice in all the world. Our human relationships are meant to express something of this aspect of God's nature. And when we say our human relationships, it's easy to think of those in our families or our friends, or our neighbours or our work colleagues, people we are most in contact with. But as Matt reminded us in his sermon, the call to act justly involves us not just regarding those we are immediately in relationship with, but also to look behind us, to look around us, to see those who maybe we haven't seen before, to notice those who are disregarded, to notice those who are lowly and to deliberately move around them to make their problems our problem, to make their concerns our concerns our living and all of our relationships are called to reflect God's passion for justice in all the world. It's interesting to note that just not on a personal level, but also on a corporate level, our sense of what mission is also involves justice and justice for the whole world. The Anglican Communion has put together five marks of mission that express the Anglican Communion's commitment to and understanding of uh, the fullness of God's mission. Here they are here on this slide. And this fifth one note, to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth, points us towards that sense in which God's justice and restorative work is for the whole of the created order. But notice also alongside the uh, proclaiming of the good news and teaching and baptising and nurturing new believers, so is the responding to human need and transforming unjust structures of society. I wonder how our sense of mission might measure up against these five. This pursuit of justice, then, in line with God's heart, is all-encompassing. It covers every aspect of our lives. So some may say, oh my word, this is too much. The scope of what we're asked to do is massive. How does my little make any difference at all? Surely it is just a drop in the ocean. My voice is too weak, another may say. No one will listen to me. 
Another may say, well, I am too old for this. Another may say, I am too young. Another may say, I am one of those that is disregarded. What might we say to those who voice such concerns? How might you counsel folk who think that their contribution is too little or their voice too small? How would you counsel them and what might you suggest that they do? Why not take a few minutes now to pause the video and either reflect on this on your own or if you're working in a group again to share some thoughts and reflections together on how you might counsel someone else in this situation. Take 10 minutes or so and then when you're ready to resume press play and uh, we'll uh, carry on. I wonder how you got on with thinking about uh, how our little can still make a difference. In Matt's sermon on Sunday, he was keen for us to remember that every single individual is a precious child of God. And so just helping one individual makes a difference. But more than that, there's something about the scale on which God invites us to work there's something about just the one. Think of the parable of the good shepherd who leaves 99 sheep in the fold to go after just the one. As much as we've just thought about how God's passion for justice involves the redemption of the whole created order, God also somehow is uniquely and personally interested in every individual story. This little video that follows is an interview of Danielle Strickland, uh, uh, a Salvation Army captain, and she's being interviewed by Compassion, who work with um, children around the world, uh, a scheme for sponsoring children in the poorest parts of our globe. And she's got some really interesting things to say about stopping for just the one. The best description of justice I've ever heard is that justice is love in public and Jesus is love personified. If I was Jesus, I mean, one of the temptations that he faced in the desert was just to like make it all happen in one go, you know, to solve the world's problems right now. And Jesus said that's not the way it's supposed to go. The, the Lord doesn't plan it that way. The Lord actually has this other plan that involves humans being humans and seeing each other as humans and helping one another and that that actually is how this kingdom is going to go. It's not going to be one big robotic, it's going to be one by one by one. And so Jesus stops for the one, he teaches about the one, he like engages the one, he heals the one. And I don't know why exactly, I can't quite figure it out. But I do know because like logistically speaking, it would be easier if we could just heal whole neighborhoods at a time, you know, like. But the kingdom works one at a time. I mean, that's just the, the process, the lost son, the lost coin, the lost sheep. I mean, this is the nature of God himself. So I think, you know, that's one of the most powerful things about the model of compassion is that it's one child. So rather than, you know, just an issue that we're all gonna fight together, which still poverty is still an issue and we still will fight it systemically, but it's, it's got a name and a face. There's a person here and the one matters to God and the one lost child matters to the Lord. And there's something really profound in a world that tries to kind of blur everybody into one thing to say, no, God cares about the one, you know, there's something really profound about it. So I think that's the kingdom model. That's how God works in the world and it's how he invites us in. And I think it's kind of to protect us maybe from being, um, you know, from being disengaged from it, like from succumbing to the idea that poverty is too complex for us, which, you know, in today's world, that's what everybody would have us believe, you know, that it's above our pay grade, that we can't quite understand the complexities of it. And so therefore there's nothing we can do about it, uh, which again is its own poverty, isn't it? But to actually say, well, you know, while you're chatting about what to do about poverty, maybe I can send Emerson to school. And then while you're chatting about how to like systemically, you know, unleash uh, food for the whole world, maybe I can give Emerson a meal. And maybe by the time Emerson is educated and fed and grows up, maybe he'll be the one that changes the world. I don't know, but until such a time as we've got this figured out, we do have a kingdom principle 
which is stop for the one. I really love that kingdom principle of uh, stopping for the one. She talks about Emerson there, who I think is a child that she sponsors via the charity Compassion. To bring that home even more, here is another story from uh, this time from International Justice Mission, uh, an organisation that seeks to end um, slavery, modern day slavery um, and sex trafficking. And uh, they work uh, in a variety of countries to rescue people from slavery and to bring about the legal structures and systems that perpetuate their freedom. The video you're about to see is about a small boy called Kofi. He could be any of our sons. And uh, Kofi remembers the day that he left home. He was eight years old and his mother introduced him to a nice man. The man told him he'd take Kofi to live with him and enrol him in school. Desperate parents in needy places uh, do things with the best intentions for their children. But there are wicked men and women who take advantage of need. This very nice man promised that he'd give Kofi a better future, a future his mother couldn't give him. But of course, it was all a lie. Instead, for the next two years, from eight to 10, Kofi worked as a slave on the shores of Lake Volta, a giant man-made body of water in East Ghana. Every day, Kofi woke up at dawn to fish for his boatmaster. And Kofi drove deep into the lake, holding his breath, and he used his small fingers to untangle the nets that got caught on tree stumps beneath the water. He knew some boys drowned doing the same thing, diving deep. One day, Kofi was casting his net when he saw a strange boat pull in, and the boat was filled with police and members of the International Justice Mission. Thanks to supporters of International Justice Mission, individuals as ordinary as you and I, They've been able to do work with Kofi and others that have enabled them to rescue him. In fact, they rescued nine other boys off the lake the same day. Kofi would later recall how he knew that this boat was different than any others he'd been on before. He knew it because someone handed him a life jacket to make sure that he was safe. When Kofi was rescued that March morning, so much was given back to him, his freedom, his childhood, his dignity. And again, because of perhaps just one person's support of that charity, for one person's generous giving, Kofi is not a slave today. Today, this young boy is smiling and laughing again. Kofi is living his dream of going to school. And so this video now shows how his life has changed now. I am afraid when I was in, in the lake. Show me. heart within me till it opens properly slow down start again from the beginning i can't keep my head from spinning out of control is this what being vulnerable feels like and i will try 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 to breathe Till it turns to my soul memory I'm only steady on my knees One day I'll stand on my own two feet On the surfaces of who I am My toes, my hand, my 
We must never underestimate uh, the difference that our generous giving makes to charities that work on our behalf and on the church's behalf to alleviate suffering and injustices around the world who work for the coming of God's kingdom. Even the smallest act can make a difference. Amnesty International works with prisoners who are being held unjustly and they often have campaigns inviting people to write to governments or to politicians or indeed to write letters to prisoners. You can't imagine the difference that someone who feels forgotten by the world uh, uh, feels and receives when they receive a letter from someone. Imagine what happens when they come in their hundreds or their thousands. Imagine what impact that has on the prison authorities or international governments as they realise the weight of support for individuals. Your letter might be just one small piece of paper or postcard, but it travels with hundreds or thousands. It has an impact. Uh, one drop in an ocean uh, may be insignificant, but if it is one drop amongst many, then that begins to make a difference. Of course, supporting international charities is not the only way that we can act justly. There are also charities closer to home like CAP and local food banks. But even this doesn't really get to the depths of what it means for our lives to be just. These concentric circles might help us to think about some of the stages or some of the aspects of acting justly that we might like to consider in our own lives. This outer circle of giving we've already looked at. Things like toilet twinning and international justice mission, compassion or Christians Against Poverty, other charities that you may know of, all working to see God's kingdom come in different places around the world. Our little that we might give to that uh, stacks up and makes such a massive difference. This does involve, of course, some personal change. It might involve us putting aside some money each month from our monthly budget, perhaps deciding to have one less takeaway or one less bottle of wine every so often, or to convert a magazine subscription that we no longer need into giving towards a charity of our choice. Matt Redman, when preparing some worship songs on justice and mission, stumbled across a, a verse in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 19, that says, When you are kind to the poor, you lend to the Lord. It's quite a remarkable verse. I'm not sure I've got my head entirely around what's involved in that verse, but there's something there about investing in the coming of God's kingdom in the here and now. Beyond giving, we might also like to think about activity that we can involve ourselves in. I think Matt referenced that idea of looking behind us, looking to see those that we might have disregarded or missed making their problems our problems might even inconvenience us a little bit, might make a change to how we spend our time and our energy. So in this circle, we might put volunteering at a local food bank or maybe writing letters to uh, uh, prisoners with Am Amnesty International or writing to your MP or to the local paper on issues that you think matter, on issues where 
you think there should be a difference made. Advocacy and speaking up for others is also part of acting justly. It may be that you know folk who are lonely or isolated and so committing to visit them on a regular basis or in this season where we're unable to do that to ring someone to make it part of your week that you involve concern and care for them as part of your life. Beyond those kind of things, then it may even involve lifestyle changes. For example, there's been a real move to be more concerned about environmental issues. It's been growing over recent decades and particularly in this past year. So how about cutting out meat for one meal a week? Or being more careful about our use of energy and resource, using the car less. Different ways of being green and caring for the environment also come under the category of acting justly. And indeed, this isn't just for the sake of the globe, for the earth itself, but also, of course, the people most affected by environmental issues, nine times out of ten, are the poorest of the poor. It may be that you make a difference to your food shopping each week so that you can put something in the food bank. You might put a note in your car to remind you that you're going to add something to your trolley that you can place in a collection point. And of course, another change we might want to make or consider is our prayer life. Maybe subscribing to a prayer diary from Tear Fund or Compassion or Christian Aid. So that we can be praying for God's kingdom to come as Jesus taught us to do. And actually building that into a regular part of our lives. This too is a kind of lifestyle change. A deliberate reorientation of ourselves towards the issues of justice and seeking God's kingdom. But there's another layer that I want to challenge us about. And Matt alluded to it when he talked about us needing to change maybe some of our internal ideas and thinking. That there might be people that we disregard who we didn't even know we were disregarding. It's kind of easy to spot issues of justice, I think, when they are far off. When we're thinking about poverty in an African country or when we're thinking about uh, uh, the slave trade or sex trafficking, these things seem to be at a real distance to us. I wonder if it's easy for us to think about pursuing justice in that regard or at least easier to think about pursuing justice in that regard than when it's right up close and personal. I heard a poem the other day that really impacted me poem by a young student called Victoria Painter and she speaks of the grace of God of this Jesus that she knows and she addresses whole different groups of people as she thinks about this love and grace and mercy and acceptance that Jesus shows them and at one point in the poem she references young women who may feel that they are somehow disregarded or overlooked amongst the crowd as she puts it of articulate young men is it possible that there are people around us that we disregard and we don't even know it? Do we as men sometimes overlook women around us? Do we as adults sometimes overlook and disregard children and young people around us? Do we as young people sometimes overlook and disregard the older generation around us? These things are really subtle and really quite deeply ingrained within us. We don't intend to, I don't think. But somehow we forget to include people who are not like us. Our own voices, often powerful, can drown out the quieter voices of others and we might not even notice it. Matt encouraged us to try and look behind us to notice those people that we might be disregarding. I think to do this work is also to act justly in line with Christ's call to follow him and with God's call for us to be involved in his work of justice in all the earth.
So a couple of questions before I conclude with a final thought. How might we ensure that we don't disregard people around us? How might we increase our attentiveness to the voice of children, young people, men and women and old people? How might we ensure that the whole family of God and all that we know around us are heard and listened to? Why not take some time now to reflect on that or discuss it as you pause the video before we bring this to a close. In a moment, we're going to pray. But I just wanted, before we do that, to share this uh, final thought, which is, of course, that this pursuit of justice as God intends is, of course, ultimately God's work. There is no way that God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven without it being the work of God. And he does graciously invite us to involve ourselves in it. And I, and I think this itself is a work of transformation. I know myself, there are many places where I'm still self-centred. In preparing this study and watching some of the videos of people in need, I've thought, oh gosh, there is so much more I could do. And, and I know that I have a thousand and one good intentions and, and that I'll struggle to turn them all into reality. And I know as well that I have hidden prejudices, hidden ways of being that disregard others, as Matt suggested. We, if we're going to step into this pursuit of justice as God intends, we, certainly I, need the transforming power of God in our lives. Nothing else is going to cut it. We're not going to be able to kind of will ourselves into the position of being more moral, more upstanding, more righteous. The gift of righteousness that we receive from Jesus Christ and that is worked out within our physical and spiritual being is, of course, in and of itself, the transforming work of God inside us. So we need to pray. We need to pray for the rich indwelling of the Holy Spirit to be at work not only in our world, but also in us, that we might be transformed, that our hearts might break for the things that break God's heart. I think there's a line in a song that we sing, uh, break my heart with what breaks yours. I, I suspect it's by God's grace that he doesn't let us into every single aspect of his sorrow for this broken world. But the thing that's going to make the most difference in our lives the thing that's most going to enable us to lean into acting justly is going to be the gift of God's Holy Spirit transforming us. And in this, I find a real marvel uh, that God challenges us and calls us to change and provides the very means by which we can experience that change. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that you love this world and that you seek justice for the entire created order, that you look to put right all that is wrong, that you look to restore this creation that you love to the fullness of that which you intended. We pray, Lord God, that your kingdom might come on earth as it is in heaven. We hear, Father, your call for us to love mercy, to act justly and to walk humbly with you, our God. Forgive us when we have made our faith a thing of personal comfort. When we have worried too much about the songs we sing or our own salvation and we have missed that our salvation is secure in Christ and you now call us to work with you and serve you in serving the needs of the world. 
Lift our eyes, we pray, Lord God, from our own personal concerns to those of others around us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Lord God, for charities that we know and support. We think of the Toilet Twinning Project and other charities that we support personally. And we ask, Lord God, that you would continue to bless those projects and that you would pour out on the leaders of those organisations great wisdom and skill as they seek to alleviate suffering in so many different ways around the world. We thank you for these men and women of faith and no faith and other faiths who seek to bring justice in the farthest corners of this earth. We pray for those who work close to home and for those who work in nations far from home. And we pray your blessing on all of them the same. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, Father, for those who are in need of justice. We pray for the poor, the destitute, the oppressed, the overlooked and the disregarded. We pray, Lord God, that you would attend and lend your ears to their cries. As you heard the cry of the Hebrews, in slavery in Egypt. So, Lord, we pray you would attend to the cries of those people today that cry out to you in faith for rescue. And we stand alongside them as we pray, come Lord Jesus, even now, to bring your kingdom to bear in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Father, for ourselves, we pray for an infilling and an outpouring of your Holy Spirit within us and upon us. Lord, we lay ourselves open to be transformed by your grace and your power. Search us and try us and see if there is any way offensive within us, Lord. Bring to our attention those places where we have disregarded others. Bring to our attention those ways in which we think and act that show a disregard for others, even though we may not intend it. Lord, bring your transforming power to bear in our lives, that we may love as you love, serve as you have served, give of ourselves as you, Lord Jesus Christ, have given of yourself for the sake of those around us. Make us attentive to the voices of those in need, of those in need of every description, that we may give of ourselves to make their issues our issues and to seek justice for them and with them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And gathering our prayers together as one, as our Lord Jesus has taught us, so we are bold to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.